Welcome to our Quick Start webinar. In the next half an hour or so, we will introduce you to Companiering's ESACOM software, give you an insight as to what ESACOM can do for you, and show you some of its capabilities with our live demo. I'm Joe Huzzy, and I will be talking you through a few slides before handing over to our Let's Design ESACOM demo. Well, we will be in the very capable hands of Andre Mernica, one of Companiering's composite engineers who has years of experience using ESACOM in various projects, but more about that later. During this webinar, your microphones will be muted just as a precaution to avoid any feedback until the Q&A forum. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the GoToMeeting message box. Okay, let's get started with what is ESACOMP and who are Companeering. In fact, let's do that the other way around. Companeering is a Finnish company which started in 2000 as a spin-off from the ESACOMP software development. That started in 1992 as a project initiated by the European Space Agency. So that explains the ESA in ESACOMP. We're based in Helsinki, Finland, with offices in Germany, that's Andre, and France, that's me. What do we do? There are two main activities, the development, sales, and support for ESACOMP, then our consulting services in the field of composite structures, design, and simulation, using ESACOMP, along with other commercial packages for FEA and optimization. So what is ESACOMP? This slide gives you a basic rundown of that. We're talking layered composites, or items that can be considered as layered structures, such as filament winding, but not braided or 3D fiber preforms. On the left, I'll just talk you down those uh, icons. The basic building block is apply, and you'll find data for many commercially available materials in the ESACOMP data bank. Now, these are the basic geometrical shapes you can consider, but you can use these to build up more complex, but still idealized items, a curved laminate with stiffness, for example. A bonded and bolted joints are included, plus there's an add-on to basic ESACOMP for cylindrical and conical shapes. This is an example of a custom development where the customer needed to design and analyze these forms, uh, cones and cylinders. So there's no secret that these go whoosh and possibly bang. Just to finish with this slide, ESACOMP is a standalone tool, but if you need full black magic of FEA, you can import ESACOMP materials and layups into the main commercial packages, ANSYS, Abacus, Nastran, and Hyperworks. We've also worked with optimi optimization packages such as Mode Frontier and Optistruct. If filament winding is of interest to you, there's the ESACOMP CompositeCAD interface for composite overwrap pressure vessels. And we have a web webinar devoted to this coming up soon. Moving on. Why use ESACOMP? Well, this slide says it all, really. At the concept stage of projects, you're looking at trade-off studies to compare and contrast, but in an efficient way. Now's not the time to devote hours setting up complex meshing and modeling. The nature of composite design means that you have to juggle many factors that may or may not be design drivers. Miss a failure mode now, and it will bite back later. We've mentioned optimization, and we shouldn't forget that Easter Comp is widely used in schools and universities as a teaching tool. You're never too old to learn something new, so I'm told. ESACOMP is available from Companeering. We offer a range of license options, PC or network-based, multi-users, lease, and special packs for education and non-commercial research. If you're a Hyperworks user, then Altair can tell you if, I, if uh, you can access ESACOMP via their APA Partner Alliance. So who uses ESACOMP? Well, we started in aerospace, but nowadays, wherever you find layered composites, you'll find ESACOMP too. Here's an idea of our presence uh, by industry sector. Uh, starting uh, top right, we can see uh, part of the A3, A380 from Patria. Uh, transport, there's the Biofall concept car, uh, an ice hockey stick. Well, we are a Finnish company, and uh, a screenshot from the analysis of the stiffened cylinder. Uh, and above that, top left, we have the analysis of the nonlinear analysis of a GRP pipe, which you see next to it. 
to conclude my introductions, uh, here are a few more examples of things that ESA Compass has helped design in aerospace, automotive, marine, oil and gas, and civil engineering. From rockets to hockey, ice hockey sticks, offshore flexible risers to America's cut boats and architectural sculptures, you can use ESACOMP. Maybe not for the entire structure, certainly looking at concepts, but also details and hotspots before they become a costly or time-consuming headache later in the project. On that note, I'll hand over to André. André, are you there? Yes, I am. Thanks, Joe. So, hello everyone. My name is André Menica. I'm an uh, engineering consultant at, uh, at Companeering. And I'm going to conduct a live demo uh, with the title, Let's Design A. And you might already ask the question what that A is going to be. And actually, uh, today we're talking about a part of a satellite structure. That's uh, not chosen because we have our roots in aerospace, just because it shows many different aspects uh, that you can do with ESA Comp, and for that reason, it was a good good example to go for uh, this short 20, 25 minutes uh, live demo part. As you can imagine, I ain't gonna go through uh, each and every detail, but at least I'll sketch out what are the possibilities. So, the part that we're actually talking about is something like this central cone here in a uh, satellite structure. This one's actually sort of orbiter by uh, Ruach Space, or parts of it uh, coming from Ruach Space, but also the design for the cone. And um, we have uh, some design restrictions, as you can imagine. I mean, that's the usual case. You start with something, and you, then you need to check, OK, uh, what are design restrictions and how to best fulfill them. So, first of all, we have this central cone, we have a measurement equipment platform, which is supposed to be attached here at the top, and has certain weight, 500 kilograms. If I recall right, yes, so probably in a later slide. Then uh, we have a <coughs> service module where that whole thing is mounted. And, uh, of course, that goes through launch and has to, launch and has to go through certain... Uh, certain criteria for that. So um, just listed here, there's some stiffness criteria, uh, axial stiffness, lateral stiffness, and bending stiffness, given in this kind of uh, spring constant format, so to say. Uh, we have requirements for the natural frequencies, because obviously it's connected to other parts, and uh, uh, there you have to take care that uh, you're not exciting anything else, for example. Um, for those stiffness cases, there's even here already, uh, like at the concept stage, uh, defined that what types of boundary conditions uh, we should use for working with those stiffness cases. And then we have some more requirements, of course, uh, going to space. There is usually some thermal stability issues as well. So that one's given, we have three different parts of the structure uh, which see different uh, temperature changes or have different allowables for uh, those uh, temperature changes then on the, uh, on the overall structure. So the overall requirements are given below here. And then there's also strength requirements. Now you might ask, okay, uh, if I have a tool like ISACOMP, which is a, a kind of a classic laminar theory, pre-design and detail uh, design tool, what do I do with that? And for that, let's switch to ISACOMP itself. So if I start up my ISACOMP, firing it up like this, you see the basic outlook of ESACOMP, and just to bear in mind that what we are working at, I have collected some of those uh, original values given in the in the specs here in the Excel because it's easier to follow if we are able to check or back check some of the values. 
So now, as you've seen, there was no material data given uh, for that case. So you might start from what you what you usually use for that type of projects. You might have some material data sheets available, uh, but you might as well have nothing. So let's start from the one possibility. You have a material sheet, so you you check some of the material suppliers and looked into the uh, looked into the data, and you have decided for something. This here is just a plain example of a material sheet, but you find the uh, tensile strength and modulus values in there, <coughs> as well as the uh, shear modulus and uh, in-plane shear strength, and some other data, of course, as well. But it might not be complete. However, starting with ISACOMP, of course, you can create a new ply and simply put in those values. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick illustration, so I ain't going to put in all the values. Um, for the demo, just to save some time to get to more interesting stuff uh, later on. But uh, first, the steps. Physical nature is one, and uh, here you can choose between reinforced plies, UD, other reinforced plies, homogeneous plies, that comes down to metals usually, um, then uh, honeycomb, foam cores, and adhesive plies. And the reason why there's this distinction is that isacomp um, when you do a strength calculation, it always checks what is the current layer uh, physical nature and what um, analysis settings do I have for that. So what set of failure criteria am I supposed to use for uh, that specific type of ply? I'll go with the UD ply here, and as you see, it narrows it down to transversely isotropic to free or autotropic. Let's go with some transversely isotropic 2, 3. Uh, thickness values uh, for the cured ply <coughs> is some of the, the basic, uh, basic values you probably have um, available, at least when you work with uh, preprex. As you can see, if you put in the density, automatically the mass per unit area is, uh, is calculated just because it's the underlying physics and that's what ISACOM does, so if something's defined in the background, then you're going to find it also calculated immediately. Um, now I just uh, throw some more or less random um, stiffness values, not to be using them afterwards, just, uh, just also to illustrate <coughs> uh, how things work in ISACOM on a very basic level. So this is, as you see, uh, just the engineering constants, there are some values missing, uh, like uh, G23 and Poisson ratio 23. If I fill the Poisson ratio, automatically I'd get the uh, uh, shear in, in 2.3, uh, just due to the isotropy that we had bef defined before. And the grayed out values work in the same way, so they are predefined because uh, we have the isotropic setting. Um, when we're looking at uh, strength definition, uh, we have the first failure stresses and strains, and we can also define ultimate failure stresses and strains, or ultimate stresses and strains, and all that uh, for different types of strength sets. You can also define your own strength sets if you want. You can uh, work with different environments, uh, as we'll see from the database when I switch to that. And uh, that's a very easy way to be um, to be switching also between different environments, so no need to put in the same material uh, twice and then switch out the materials in some structure, but rather uh, change it, uh, just change the environment and then use it. So uh, here again, if I put in a value uh, as we're talking uh, linear, <coughs> linear elastic behavior, uh, until the first ply failure occurs. Um, we'll do a calculation of one or the other. So if you put in the strains, the uh, stresses are going to be calculated. If you put in the stresses, like uh, here, <coughs> the strains are going to be calculated. And if you're missing some of the material values, which can be if you have it from a data sheet, um, 
feel free to look into our typical materials as well or find similar materials and try to fill it from there because that's <coughs> usually uh, giving you a good uh, approximation of which direction it's gonna it's gonna be of course talking uh, aerospace as I said thermal expansion can be important and besides that you can also uh, work with the moisture expansion so you can include those both and then see depending on uh, on the environment change what are the uh, induced stresses or <coughs> residual stresses of the curing or something like this so that's very easily done and one specialty uh, also is uh, statistical distributions which can be defined for certain <coughs> excuse me for certain uh, mechanical properties uh, which can then later on be incorporated in a probabilistic analysis so that you can see how this variation of certain values influences uh, the properties of the whole laminate and not just that, that one ply. Okay, now as you could see we haven't defined all the uh, all the right constants so that's why I got a warning but anyway I ain't going to use that uh, material any further during the demo. Here on the left side uh, in ESACOMP you see the database or the access to certain uh, items that you regularly use uh, like in the, in the recent cases or to your own user directory which uh, resides in your home directory so you have quick access to that. You might connect a company uh, directory uh, like a network drive or something and of course there's the database and that's the place where many of uh, of the project projects actually start from so if you already know what you're looking for uh, you can basically go through the different levels as you see there's uh, adhesives there are different core materials fibers and matrix materials and various plies available currently more than thousand material systems all in all so let's say you, you're looking for uh, carbon epoxy <coughs> and uh, then you click yourself through to one of the material providers uh, first one here being SciTech in the list and uh, that one just as an example is a, is a very complete it's a very complete set so it's got the basic values it's got the engineering constants first failure stresses and strains and statistical distributions for that one environment and Additionally to that, there's three other environments. So we got cold, dry, uh, hot, dry, and hot, wet. And in between, ESACOMP can even <coughs> uh, approximate the values as well. So we do, do an interpolation. But let's come back to our original uh, problem, which is uh, designing the cylinder cone. And for that, um, I would use the database search because I know that I'd like to use some material that I've used before <coughs> and uh, I know it started something with HM30 or so and I can combine that with uh, a search for material that is having a terminal expansion which is negative in the in X direction or in fiber main direction just to be able to uh, really design for thermal expansion as well because usually as you know it's it's positive unless you have a Kevlar or carbon fiber in most cases so let's just combine those two and search my user cases and also the data bank and uh, Okay, that's going through all the thousand materials, and uh, it finds some uh, some suitable material here in one of my cases. Actually, also shows uh, what is the uh, extension uh, thermal exp expansion coefficient. I can view the object and see that uh, all I need is is is, is pretty fine material from Sati actually, and I can just import it. Uh, to my case 
<coughs> if I had just searched uh, for some HM30 ply uh, and not using the other uh, criterion, we have found quite a number of more of those HM uh, Sati materials, as you see here. Okay, let's switch back. So we come back from the search and we have automatically switched to active case mode. So the active case mode is the one where at least I, as a kind of a long time ESA computer, spend most of my time. Also in database mode, you can do most of the calculations. So you just right click and you'll find the full list um, of what you can do uh, in a quick study. Um, but the advantage of the active case view for that is that you have always the most important things for a certain task connected in, in, in one picture and you see how those relate to each other. So now we only have a apply and uh, <coughs> we'd like to use uh, uh, or build a honeycomb sandwich so we are still missing the core material and uh, if I recall right just from seeing the design exercise where I imported the one material I can also grab the core material so we can see here that it's a core ply uh, we have mechanical data and everything defined that we need and uh, let's start from that build, <coughs> building up a laminate as I said it's going to be a sandwich so we can immediately call it sandwich as well and uh, at this stage um, when, when I've been looking at uh, what's the constraints and the, the given values <coughs> you already know quite a number of things so we have the diameter, we have the length and we have the maximum mass and starting from that we can actually uh, calculate um, using the cylinder area to be expected uh, what's the mass per area that is allowed for our laminate so um, as, uh, as I said we ain't gonna go through all the iterations so I just put um, I just put a layup which somewhat uh, fulfills <coughs> our requirements so don't wonder if the, the first quick shot looks just uh, too good to be true so as you've seen we have just clicked our laminate together uh, rather quickly we can put in the symmetry and view the layup so here you see that the HM30 ply uh, is in the face sheets and uh, the uh, core material here is put in as the 50-52 aluminum <coughs> honeycomb uh, right in the middle and it's not mirrored so we have put in an odd symmetry to leave out the, the middle layer from that uh, mirroring. And what we can already see, we have a weight per unit area which is in the region, so that's not exactly fulfilling, but as I said, that's not what we are going for in that quick study. We also see what's the thickness of the laminate, so we can also take that and, and use it later on in the process. Now we should start checking some some of the values for uh, for our cone. Uh, what we what we already know is the uh, thermal stability. So I have just listed those three sections that were given in the uh, in the problem description, and in this year I have filled some values which or some result of another layup. But we could go in here and just do an half, two and a half D analysis for that. And uh, the first thing that this allows us is to see what are the laminate properties. So we see uh, in plane moduli, uh, we see uh, Poisson ratio and also the much expected uh, thermal expansion coefficients. So this one here 
alpha x is the is the critical one for the axial thermal stability and if I use this number here in the Excel sheet uh, we can easily see uh, those sum up to a number of uh, 0.0818 uh, millimeters and what was our allowable is around 2 millimeters uh, 0 0.02 millimeters so we are just just below that and uh, this first uh, step would basically be covered of course usually it's more of an iteration but but you can see that it's rather easy to to get to those values let's say you are not hitting the right spot uh, in the very beginning which is the usual case then what you can do for example is you can duplicate the laminate and exchange some of the layers <coughs> so for this case I'd like to simply replace the plus minus 45 layers uh, with some plus minus theta layers and uh, the magic behind those is that in the analysis you can vary those so you can rotate those and see what's the effect uh, on the laminate stiffness on the laminate strength or on the laminate uh, thermal expansion so we see here we got this new uh, so-called theta laminate and if we go into the two and a half D behavior now, um, just looking at our alpha X, maybe also alpha Y, we see where we end up. So uh, we see that when we vary that around the around the thirty degrees, uh, that's the lowest, or actually a negative uh, thermal expansion still. And if we went for some other values, we could actually get it even to uh, to approximately zero. If that's not uh, good enough, just to see it from from the chart, of course you can get the the plain numbers as well. So let's sweep from 30 to 60 degrees uh, in steps of five and switch to to the numbers. Let's maybe have a look at the stiffness and the uh, expansion coefficients as well and here you see uh, what's the what's the variation so actually the effect on the uh, on the thermal expansion seems quite more considerable than the effect that we see uh, in the in-plane modulus so that's the the first of the problems uh, somewhat tackled uh, next one would be <clears throat> uh, looking at the stiffness and there are different ways to go about that one would be to just build a cylinder with the cylindrical shell module uh, see how that extends under the under the thousand Newton uh, kind of unit load um, and see will it be below that magic value so below the uh, 7 e minus 6 uh, meters and just with the relation kind of uh, force equals uh, spring constant time displacement uh, times displacement so that's that's very basic <coughs> that can easily be done in a similar way uh, you could do that with uh, with a beam analysis and uh, I'd do that now just quickly we know we got a circular profile we have the layup already defined we can simply say what was the inner uh, diameter the outer is calculated by the thickness of our laminate added on top of that uh, and we got our beam in the background that also works as beam elements so there are some requirements as to what types of uh, laminates are allowed or not so if you'd be working with an unsymmetric laminate uh, that would work and you would need to go uh, either with the uh, curve plate analysis or cylindrical shell. Now let's have a look at the cross-section properties because basically those could be enough to tell us uh, will the whole thing be stiff enough uh, or not. Uh, because if we look at the axial stiffness uh, EX times A we get this uh, <coughs> value here 577,000 gigapascal uh, 
square millimeters. And once again, a quick hand calculation uh, would actually reveal uh, what is the <coughs> what's the uh, EA uh, needed. So in this case here, we have uh, six uh, six hundred fifteen. Uh, if we actually go to this one, we see that it's 615 gigapascal uh, square millimeter. So this one here would not be uh, stiff enough to fill that if we if we just calculate it by that. But as I said, anyway, you're always going through sev several iterations, and it's not the not the aim to bring us to the end result uh, with that. What else did we have? Um, we had axial stiffness, but there's also lateral stiffness uh, and bending stiffness. Uh, two other cases that were defined uh, here. Uh, so with those boundary conditions, and that one thing I'd just like to do with the uh, with the quick study in the beam uh, part is uh, the response to that end moment. So I'll just use the length that we know, it's 4,300 millimeters. <coughs> uh, we have the bending moment or the bending stiffness uh, given here as this constant. So we just calculate that back as well. We assume certain load that we put in here and back check um, is it going to have the right stiffness for that. And uh, for that scroll down a bit so we see here uh, there's this uh, bending moment also to be calculated in an easy manner with this kind of spring constant and, uh, and the rotational angle of the end piece and if we use uh, as it was defined this uh, clamped and simply supported <coughs> and introduce our load We can very quickly see what's the uh, what's the result for that. So here, using the transverse load, there are different things. We can get the, the deflection line. We can get the bending moments, shear forces, uh, and so on. First, I'll have a look at the deflection line. And basically, uh, if you say uh, put a tangent here in, in the end you would already be able to, to calculate what is the rotation uh, of the end piece. Of course, if you use the cylindrical shell module, you can really check what are the elements displacements and, uh, and go for a more, uh, more precise calculation. But from this here already, you can, you can grasp the values or more easily probably looking at, uh, at the full list. So we know uh, it's about the, uh, the rotation at the end, so you could grab the length, which is uh, 86 millimeters. Uh, you have the the displacement, which is uh, 0 0.126 millimeters, and by this and basic trigonometry, some uh, uh, tangents uh, backwards calculation, you'll find out what's the actual uh, uh, degrees that is allowed and whether uh, it's it's sufficient or not. <coughs> so <coughs> that was another quick way and now before <coughs> heading into uh, the last five minutes for Q&A, let's also go to some uh, higher structural elements and for that uh, we go with a cylindrical shell just do a quick definition of our cone once again. The diameter is supposed to be on the inside. <coughs> we know the 1050 on both sides. Uh, we have a sandwich laminate, the only one we use currently, that we put in throughout the whole length. If you had some reinforcements in certain places where you've taken up the laminate, you could add those and uh, 
um, build a longer uh, longer cylinder or put parts in between, but we don't need that for now. Also, you have the possibility to include uh, axial and ring stiffeners. Same goes when you're working with uh, plate analysis. You have uh, stiffeners available in both directions, either uh, shell-based head stiffeners or beam-based uh, stiffeners like uh, eye stiffeners or Z or things like that. Uh, no need to have a preview because, well, it's such a simple case that we wouldn't gain much from that. <coughs> now, boundary conditions. Um, for the one case that we that we'd quickly like to solve, we just go for um, uh, the forces given here. <coughs> and the definition originally was that the left side, the interface to the um, service module is clamped or to be considered as clamped, and the other one is to be considered as, as a free end, but the circumference is, uh, is constrained. So we are not changing the shape of, uh, of the cone because there's anyway, go anyway going to be some aluminum uh, um, fittings around that which prevent any of that change. So that's the first thing what we also need is the load definition and the way this is done um, is through all those basic values which you can put on <coughs> either ends and some of those are also of course uh, valid, valid, valid for the whole structure like the accelerations so if I'd like to uh, look for that load response and strength analysis with the uh, uh, accelerations given here I could do that but for that I'd need to first introduce the mass on top of that which I ain't gonna do right now so we have uh, some actual load given 50 kilonewton um, 20 up there <coughs> and the end is not a torsional but, uh, but it was a bending bending moment given like this uh, and in these three quick steps you're basically ready to go uh, you can do the actually let me correct one of the forces because um, the force got to be negative in here <coughs> as the mass is on top uh, during launch and during standing and then we just uh, do a load response failure analysis. I haven't been talking much about what are the available failure criteria, what uh, what's you can do with the strength analysis and, st and stuff. So, quick detour to uh, our analysis options. As you can see here, for the UDs, there's a very extensive list of available failure criteria. Uh, Puck in 2D, 3D, there's Tsai-Hil, tsai, -Hil, tsai -Bu, uh, Lark, Hashin. And also max fiber stress for people who uh, like to import their composite cut uh, models into uh, ESACOMP and then check the, their pressure vessels with just the max fiber stress and so on and so forth. So there's all the other options for different mechanical uh, types or material types that we have been discussing earlier. I can also change the mesh settings. Uh, so if if the mesh is not detailed enough, for example, for uh, a buckling analysis or nonlinear analysis even and then you're able to change the settings in there so let's have the analysis run <coughs> what happens in the background is that we we mesh and build the model for Elmer which is our integrated FE solver and that one gives the results back uh, back to us and we do the post-processing uh, for the composites related part. So now here we start with the reserve factor already or inverse reserve factor. If we look at the deformed plot we can also see uh, the biggest effect probably have the moment and the uh, transverse force that were given. 
but I can also look at uh, certain displacements. I have those all available. Um, radial, tangential, I can even check the uh, <coughs> theta, so that would have been the, the quicker way probably to to get to this uh, rotation value for the moment that we were talking about in the beginning. And, and some others, all the forces and uh, moments of the elements are available. <coughs> but where it gets more interesting is actually looking at some of the uh, failure types that are going to be present in, uh, in the model. So for that, I just zoom in into part of the structure and activate the labels. So here we have uh, just the element ID, uh, not that important right now, but sometimes you want to just write down the element IDs and uh, look at the full list uh, of all the element values and maybe do something else, export it to Excel or so. <coughs> or just <coughs> for the case that you'd like, in, look, like to look into some details and uh, and see what goes on in there. Then uh, we see the failure mode, and this is uh, uh, fiber fracture, fracture in compression here, and the critical layer is also named, which is the eleventh layer of uh, of the structure, material type A with a zero degree layer. But that doesn't say that much yet, so let's have a look into the element. <coughs> So what you can get is uh, both load response or first ply failure analysis. So if you see uh, changing uh, the uh, chart to margin of safety, what are the what are the most critical layers in this case? Well, we already know it's the eleventh layer, um, but you'd like to maybe see what could be the reason uh, for that. So. If I go to the load response analysis, we can go through all the different uh, settings in here, all the different uh, coordinate systems, and look at the stresses and see what happens inside there. Results can be saved as quickly as this and accessed later on, so you don't have to redo the calculation. You just go back to that cylinder and find the result there. Just double click and there it comes back again. So that's, that's a really fast way to uh, get back to real results. One thing I'd still like to show uh, is the natural frequencies. Normally, as we know, this cone has uh, a mass on top. You'd have to incorporate that, uh, and that can easily be done, adding uh, an additional uh, piece in the end and putting, for example, a steel ring or something just to have an equivalent mass. Uh, which which influences the behavior, but for this case to be quick, I just do the uh, natural frequency analysis as such. And uh, I'll switch on the animation, although I'm not 100% sure that the animation comes through uh, through the go-to meeting that well. Uh, and we can see that lowest uh, lateral frequency here uh, is 73 hertz, and checking here, okay, that's uh, that's not not much of a problem, and we can go through the different modes uh, and see what happens in there. And uh, usually we find the uh, necessary modes, and as you can see, there's always the <coughs> always the frequency given together with the mode and uh, yeah obviously as we start from the lowest uh, there's no risk uh, hitting those uh, excel frequencies but that's most likely due to the reason that we haven't incorporated the mass obviously the heavy mass on top brings that whole frequency down but as I said it's just an illustration <coughs> there are quite some other modules, as my colleague Joe already mentioned. We can do FE import, we can do FE export, um, and post-processing uh, for that. Uh, there's bonded joints, mechanical joint analysis, and there's the plate analysis, which is very versatile. You can put uh, 
a number of point loads, so distributed uh, distributed pressure, uh, shear, or other edge loads. So with this one, actually, that's a very uh, abstract uh, or very useful part when you work with abstract structures or parts of your structure. And uh, yeah, to stay in time, uh, I'd say we can open the question and answer session. Um, feel free also to use the chat box if you have a Okay, it seems no one uh, would like to step in front of the audience and ask a question. So uh, let's go with one of the questions from the chat box, um, which is, how does the optimization with ESACOM work? And uh, well, that's a very general question, and <clears throat> certainly this is not the not the right spot probably to go into any details, but <clears throat> I can assure you uh, we can uh, uh, make contact afterwards, but just to uh, give you a quick idea about how that works. First of all, opposing to structural optimization, we usually use a parameterized laminate concept where we have the uh, laminate orientation or layer orientations and thicknesses as well as materials possibly as, as design variables and that's then coupled uh, with tools like uh, like mode frontier into a bigger process <coughs> where genetic algorithms or evolutionary evolutionary algorithms um, are used to converge to the optimum result but maybe that that's just as a as a glimpse of uh, of how that works Okay, so if there's no other questions, uh, feel free to uh, to contact us. Contact information has been here on the slide. Just mail us or call us. Instacom at companyarin.com is the main support address. And uh, if there's no quick questions coming up, I'd like to thank you for joining us today and see you around next time.